Excellent. We'll get started then. So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, I hope everybody's keeping well and healthy and hanging in. Uh, and let's crack on with the webinar that we have today. Uh, my name is Gary Hodgson, and I'm delighted to be introducing you to today's iCoach Kids Shares Live webinar, which is our 20th issue. Behind the scenes, we have Barnaby Sergeant Medics, who without this, none of this would happen. So thank you, Barney. Uh, and also with me, I have Sergio Lara Berthial. Hi, Sergio. Hi, Gary. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for making the time to join us today. Today, we're going to explore the topic of physical literacy and coaching for health with three fantastic guests. But before we meet them, back to Gary for some housekeeping. Yeah, thanks, Sergio. Um, so again, just, just a reminder to those who are just joining us, uh, while you're here today, please make sure that you keep your cameras and microphones off. Um, submit any questions that you may have via the chat function, uh, whether or not you're on Zoom or if you're watching live on YouTube, just type your questions into the into the comment section there. And please be sure to be respectful to everybody who is is on a part of this webinar today. Um, Sergio, back over to you. Thanks, Gary. And before we get going, let me just explain how the session is going to run. First, I will do a very brief scene setting about this extremely important topic. Then uh, I will hand over to our first guest to introduce our other two guests uh, and they will present their work. And when they finish, we will ask them some questions before opening for your questions from the audience. So please make sure that you are submitting questions as we go along uh, through the chat. Um, what can I say about physical literacy? Well, it is a term that has become extremely popular over the last 20 years. Data shows that both children and adults are struggling to meet the recommended physical activity guidelines in most countries around the world. This pandemic of inactivity and sedentary lifestyles has been shown to have a negative impact on both our physical and mental well-being. And physical literacy has been proposed both as a goal in itself, but also as a tool to combat this trend. Physical literacy, however, has also been misunderstood and at times misused. To discuss all of this, we have assembled a great panel of experts. To introduce our guests, we have one of our founding members, Declan O'Leary from Sport Island. Declan is the head of research and design for Sport Island Coaching and the lead officer for Disability Sport. Hi, Declan, great to have you with us today. And over to you, Declan, to introduce our panelists. Hi, Sergio, and thank you. Um, yeah, I'll introduce our presenters. I'll start with Stephen and then later on with Sarah Jane. Dr. Stephen Behan is part of the business development team at Dublin City University. And Stephen was one of the lead researchers on the Moving Well, Being Well project. One of the largest research programs of its kind in the world, Moving Well, Being Well broke the mold, intervening early in a child's life to increase their physical literacy and provide them with the tools to be active for life. A focus was on improving children's confidence and motivation towards physical activity through developing their fundamental movement skills. Stephen's interest in health and human performance continues in his current role. Stephen has also worked with a background as a games promotion officer for Dublin Gaelic Athletic Association, where he worked on the ground with various clubs across the city. He has presented his work at numerous international conferences and published in a number of peer-reviewed journals. And Stephen presented at the third international I Coach Kids conference, which was held in Limerick in 2019. So over to you, Stephen. Thanks very much, Declan. Um, that was uh, when I heard Declan was introducing me. I was a little bit worried, but that was actually very nice. So I uh, appreciate it. Um, so I'll crack on straight away. Uh, you might give me a thumbs up, someone, if they can see that screen. OK, just to make sure. Yeah, brilliant. So uh, delighted to be here. Thanks, million, for the um, opportunity. Um, so I, I, I like to start with this picture here. So that's myself and uh, eight of my closest friends. Uh, we played together since we were maybe uh, five or six. So that's me in the back left there, a lot younger and with a lot more hair. But um, uh, that was uh, maybe 10 or 12 years ago at a, at a little tournament that we were playing in. Um, and I'll come back to the reason why I have that photo in. Um, but as Declan would have mentioned, my background is in Gaelic games and I would have worked for the GAA for a long time. Um, and part of my role was going into schools and coaching and trying to get kids interested in Gaelic games and trying to get them to... Uh, 
to take part, not just in school, but also outside school. But I couldn't get my head around why so many kids at 9, 10, 11, 12 had no interest in taking part, not just in my activities, but in any activity. So to cut a long story short, I was very lucky to get involved with it with a great team in DCU. Um, and you'll hear from one of my colleagues uh, shortly after it's Sarah Jane. But we started the Moving Well, Being Well project. And it was sort of a big focus on this was for, on physical literacy. So when we talk about physical literacy, uh, it's a complicated uh, it's complicated, right? But I'm going to try and explain it very, very simply here and uh, and give us a, a sort of a, a breakdown of what, what we tried to go at. And w- I'm going to focus in on one area in particular. So physical literacy, the physical competence, confidence, motivation to be active for life. As I said, it's complicated, but just think about it like this. If um, we have the physical competence, so that's the basic underlying skills. That means we'll be confident to take part in activities that have those skills uh, and that means we'll be motivated to take part in activities with those skills, which means we do it more often, which means we get better and you have this cycle. So imagine uh, Declan is good at kicking a ball. OK, uh, that means he's confident to do it with his friends, with his family. OK, which means he's motivated to take part in a game of football, potentially with their friends or family or whatever it may be, which means he gets better. And this positive spiral starts uh, from and that can start from an early age. OK, um, we know that these different tools to be active for life. So we talk about having fun and enjoyment as our first thing when kids come into us. Uh, we provide a safe environment. We allow them to express themselves and develop that confidence and motivation. And then we give them the basic movement skills to be active, okay? So we talk about this positive spiral uh, that that we can start early in life, but we we can also have this negative spiral of disengagement and that can begin at an early age. So what that is, is that they don't have the basic underlying skills. So imagine we're all in school and the ball is thrown in for a game of football and Declan is brilliant. He's flying around the place. He knows uh, how to play. He's used to the hustle and bustle. He passes to me, who's not from a sporty background. I don't have those basic skills. Ball bounces off my foot. The other team score a goal. You know the rest. But what happens is everyone notices I'm not as good as Declan. And then uh, I notice myself that I'm not as good as Declan. So think about that happening all the time. And that's where you can get this negative spiral of disengagement really from an early age. But the good news is we can create a positive spiral of engagement, okay, by focusing on on this physical literacy. And I'm specifically going to talk about the fundamental movements aspect of that. So you probably all heard these before, like physical literacy. Sometimes the the terms are used interchangeably. But we're basically talking about the foundational movements needed to progress to more complex skills, okay? So we're talking about really simple things, running, jumping, hopping, skipping, throwing, catching, really, really simple skills. And they're divided up into various different categories. So we've locomotor, which is moving your body, object control, uh, which is the, the kicking, the catching, the throwing, etc. And then we've got stability or balance skills, okay? So all are really important. And I'm gonna talk you through uh, why. So I want you to think like, how are we taught how to read? We weren't just given a book uh, and asked to read it. We were taught the alphabet, the sounds of the letters, how to put them into words, sentences, etc. And from that then, we were eventually able to form sentences and then be able to read that book eventually. So it's the same with movement. We don't want to ask particularly young kids to take part in activities in which they don't have the basic underlying skills to do so. So what we did as part of Moving Well, Being Well, we tried to measure as much physical literacy components or anything that may add to it as we possibly could. So again, focusing on those fundamental movement skills, we looked at the mastery or near mastery of these skills. So here's all the skills we assessed on the left-hand side of your screen. Okay, so you can see run all the way down to overhand throw. And when I say mastery or near mastery, what I'm talking about is that they can do it perfectly every single time, or they can do it nine out of 10 times, like they're nearly there, all right? And again, really, I can't emphasize enough how simple these skills are. Small little component, uh, component-based uh, tests to see if they can uh, perform the, sk- the, the skill adequately. Now you can see here up the top run, 75% have mastered the skill, all right? This is over 2000 kids ranging in age from five to 12. And you might be thinking, oh, 75%, that's not too bad. But then think about it, that's, that's one in four kids that can't run properly. All right, and then start thinking about how many activities because that potentially preclude them from. Okay, so when you start thinking about like that and you look at all the other skills, 
then you start thinking, okay, well, maybe this isn't great. And maybe this is, we, we have to address this problem. So what we did next then is we looked at all these skills across the age group. So across the bottom of your graph here, right? You have the ages. So age five up to age 12. So basically corresponds to each year in school. And we looked at the progression from age all the way up. So what you have here, these green arrows are signifying a significant jump. So the, five, the six year olds were significantly better than the five year olds, the seven significant than the six and so on, all the way up to the age of 10. But then, we have this sort of plateau. So there's a slight increase from 10 to 11, but nothing nothing, nothing to write home about, nothing to really uh, hone in on. And there's actually a tiny decrease from 11 to 12. So what's happening here at age 10 that these skills are not progressing as they should? Because all the research out there, you can see that line, that red line that's just come in there, that's the top score achievable. So it's not like we got to the top and we're staying there. We're still a good bit away from it. All the research would tell us that we should be able to master these skills by the age of eight, give or take a year or two, and depending on the complexity of the skill, but we should be able to master all these basics by the age of eight. But what's happening here at age 10, 11, 12, and how is that affecting these kids going into their adolescence? Uh, so we hear all the time about kids, uh, adolescents dropping out of sport. We hear kids 13, 14, 15, major uh, areas for the, where they drop off sport. But what if this is happening earlier? What if something's happening earlier and when they go into 13, 14, 15, it's now just a catalyst of maybe a new school, a new team, or maybe a competitiveness. That's the catalyst for them to jump away. So this is something that we're really trying to explore and look at uh, further. We talk about um, these fundamental movement skills and we talk, we looked at, tried to look at them across gender and age as well. So boys in the blue, yet girls in the yellow. And only at age 11 and 12 do the boys have a significant, they're significantly better than the girls at ages 11 and 12. Okay, so you might, again, same as me, when I first looked at these results, I was like, oh, not too bad. I thought there'd be differences throughout. But when we break this down, remember what I said earlier about locomotor, object control and stability skills, when we break them down. So when we look at these, uh, at their locomotor skills, we can see the girls are significantly better than the boys all the ages from five up to 10, barring six, okay? We can see when we look at stability, uh, when we look at object control skills, then we can see that the boys are better than the girls at every age group, significantly better by a wide margin. So why is this important? Well, we know um, that looking at the, the, we know when we look at these fundamental movement skills, that kids who master these skills at a, at a young age are more likely to go on to be active in the teenage years. So think of the information that this is giving us here now. We're talking about, we know the boys are ahead of the girls uh, in the object control skills. We know the girls are ahead of the boys in the locomotor skills, and that's in an Irish context. So now we know, well, there's a certainly a focus we need to put on now. There's something we need to improve on to help them be as active as they possibly can be in whatever activity they wish in the teenage years. And the research would show us that those with the better proficiency at a young age are more active, active as teenagers. So how do we do this? Well, we go back and we think about our physical literacy model. So the physical competence, that's the basic underlying skills and they lead into the more sports specific uh, skills. And then we have to do it in a way that uh, improves confidence and fosters confidence and motivation so that we can continue to get better and they continually want to take part in activities, whether it be sport, competitive sport, uh, individual sport, whatever they prefer to be involved in. Okay, and we see so many different, um, we have these pathways, long-term athletic development pathways, where it shows an active start, fundamentals, physical literacy, and they're lovely and they're neat, okay, and they look the part, and uh, don't get me wrong, they're really, really important, and we do need to be looking at these but it gives you the impression that this is perfect. Once we do this, the next part will fall in. So this one here I like is fundamental movement skills. Then you've got your fundamental sports skills, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as it goes up, okay? But in reality, and we all know this as coaches ourselves, it's not like that. It's, it's much more complicated. This is a more accurate representation. If you're dealing with a group of kids, you've got different groups are at different, different kids at different levels. Some kids are very confident, some are not. So we need to think as coaches, well, how do we actually help all of those kids to get those basic movement skills, to, uh, to be, develop them in a, in a way that's such that they're confident and they're motivated to try it, which starts that positive spiral of engagement that I mentioned earlier on. 
So there's a few ways. It, when you look at the coaching literature and there's people on this call who'd be much better up on, on this sort of stuff than me, but I really like this one, the scaffolding approach. So we think small steps each time, little by little by little, and we give the, uh, kids a safety net. Whereas if they don't go too hot, if they go try to reach too far, they, they have a, a safety net to come back on. So it's step by step by step. We talk, Nintendo, I, I love this. I, I use this slide a lot because Nintendo had it sussed from years ago. Back in the 80s or, or, or early 90s, most people had some sort of a game like this. And it was a case of, yes, yeah, just that one more level, one more level, one more level. And they're very smart in how they do it because you go after it, you, you kill the boss at the end of Super Mario Brothers and then you get to the next level. Straight away, you run out, you get killed yourself in the computer game, but you just go back to where you started from. So they're forever scaffolding you all the way along. You get more confident and then you're motivated to get to the next step, the next level. OK, um, we talk about, uh, uh, again, I love that picture and um, it, it, the importance of small steps. And, and it sort of ties in with, with what I would feel is really strongly rooted in my own coaching philosophy in terms of social development theory. So this really, really old research, but it stands true to the day. What a child can do with assistance today, she will be able to do by herself tomorrow. And that talks about the social interaction, uh, cognitive development, the more knowledgeable other, which is you as the coach and that zone of proximal development, okay? So this one here is, it's really clear. That white circle down at the bottom or oval, it, we can't do that, or that's too easy. They can do that perfectly. But likewise, the black one on the top right is too hard. It's too big of a leap, too much scaffolding to climb up or too many levels to jump in, in Nintendo. The flow is where they're able to do things on their own, in the zone. You hear uh, people talk about that all the time, but this is the sweet spot, this zone of proximal development that you're, you're able to help as a coach, help them develop uh, with a little bit of help by using their scaffolding techniques or your Super Nintendo techniques or whatever it is. But by you knowing your kids and knowing the, the, the kids that you're involved coaching, you should be best placed to be able to help kids individually in that manner. So, so what I say here is we think of that the, the small steps matter, you the coaches are that ladder. Okay, so what I'd say is you build that foundation that sets children up to be active and to participate in sport. And look, it might turn out that it's not your sport, but that's okay because uh, we want, sorry, I got ahead of myself there. Um, we know if we provide a safe and a fun and a challenging environment that, that's set to each kid individually, but as part of a group, we know then that, that we're setting them up to be active for life. And I think people get caught up on this performance versus participation side, whereas I, I don't think it has to be one or the other. Um, because we know um, if kids are happy, if they're motivated, if they're confident, they're more likely to perform at a higher level. My colleague of ours in, in DCU, uh, Anya McNamara, talks about the rocky road to the top all the time. And I'll skim over this, but it's a really interesting uh, uh, paper in terms of uh, winning is OK. Kids like to be competitive. They like to win. So that's OK. But, but it doesn't have to be a dirty word when we're talking about participation. The two of them can go hand in hand, but we just have to realize what our priorities are at different areas as, as we're going through that, that coaching life cycle. We know active kids do better in life. So this, for me, when we're dealing with young kids in particular, this has to be our, our, our overriding end goal to keep kids active as, as long as possible. And we know that all the, 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 the health benefits that come with it will feature right throughout their life. And we know if they're active kids tend to be active teenagers and that then hopefully goes through into adulthood and beyond and um, lastly i just want to finish so my own club in gaa so we uh, had a social value report done on the club and, and, and trying to quantify in a monetary value what they offer to a community in a year um, and i tended out this is a volunteer club now it's a big club three and a half thousand members but it ended up with 50 million in social value created in the local community in that year and why is this important? Because when we when they broke it down, um, these independent people, they broke down the value on that and it was improved health was nearly 30 million. Friendships then after that was nearly 20 and then sense of belonging. OK, so it's just really useful. And I think affirming for us, it certainly was in the club to see that we're having such a, an impact on, on kids' lives in terms of their health and the friendships that they create. And that sort of brings me back to this picture. These are eight of my closest friends. and for me, um, the people who invested all the time in coaching us when we were kids and some of them were our parents and others were just volunteers. But from within that group, we have um, four have played senior at both hurling and football in the club. Seven have played senior at one, one code or the other. 
Uh, one has won a, a championship in a club championship at the elite level. Uh, four have represented Dublin at some level. One has won medals with Dublin. Two are involved with coaching at a, at a really high level. Uh, one is a, a, the senior manager in the club at the moment. One is an adult games chairman in the club, back volunteering. One was a, a club vice chairman. That was myself for my sins. Uh, six have coached at underage in the club and continue to do so. And seven are still playing at some level or at least trying to. And again, I count myself there um, uh, trying to play as best we possibly can. But for me, that's, that's a huge barometer of success for the coach. Uh, that the coaches that invested their time with us um, uh, early on. So look, um, I talked an awful lot about the, the why and, and the how, I suppose, was uh, the what you could use. There's a lot of resources there that anyone could use in terms of moving well, being well, and um, some good game, uh, uh, resources there. Um, and the, the iCoach Kid resources, of course, as well are fantastic. Uh, listen, I've gone slightly over time, so hopefully uh, Declan won't give out to me too much, but uh, thanks for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards. Thanks very much, Stephen. And you're right, we will go to the questions afterwards. That was a very interesting presentation. Thank you very much. I'll now take the opportunity to introduce Sarah Jane Belton, and it's my pleasure to do, show, do so. Sarah Jane is an Associate Professor of Physical Education and Head of the School of Health and Human Performance at Dublin City University. Sarah Jane's background is in physical education, physical activity, physical literacy and movement. Sarah Jane has published widely in a range of peer-reviewed journals, book chapters and textbooks. She has lead on and been involved in a range of national projects and intervention programs in the area of young people's physical education and movement, including youth physical activity towards health and moving well-being. Her work has been concerned with understanding factors associated with regular physical activity participation in youth, including global elements such as well-being, physical elements such as cardiovascular fitness and body composition, but also psychological and psychosocial factors such as barriers and motivators for physical activity, self-esteem and self-efficacy, attitudes and levels of self-determination. In Ireland, we are currently working on a, at a public endorsement stage in the development of a physical literacy consensus statement. And Sarah Jane has been a part of the research team that has underpinned this positive and very exciting development in Irish sport. So over to you, Sarah Jane. Thank you very much, Declan. Very much appreciated. Um, yeah, so I'm going to go straight in as well. We'll share screen and cross the fingers and hope that everything works as it should. So now again, I'll just get a thumbs up, Declan. I can see you if you if you can see the screen properly. Perfect. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, the, folks, it's a pleasure to be here, and and thanks for for having me, and thanks for listening to myself and Stephen. Um, and it's great to follow on from Stephen as well. I very much like to feel that I have contributed to any hair loss he might feel he has had over the last number of years. Um, but we can talk about that another time. Before I go on to, into too much detail on the topic, I want to just present my angle because I, I think it is important. I do coach and, and I've played sport at a, at a variety of levels from participation up to up to elite sport. But fundamentally, I'm actually just about activity. I'm about, about kids being active. I'm about uh, kids growing, growing into movement, growing onto movement, growing into active adolescents who love moving and then into active adults who love moving. I'm about coaching kids. Um, but be, and I do coach kids. But being honest, the sport that I'm coaching at any given time is completely secondary in terms of what I'm trying to achieve with the kids. And, and that does center around physical literacy. So I'm gonna show you a very short video here, which hopefully will play and hopefully you can hear. <laughs> this video for me fundamentally captures what we want to achieve. We want kids out playing, having fun, embracing whatever opportunities they have available to them. During lockdown, the opportunities tend to be like this. Fundamentally, these kids grow up into adults, and we want those adults equally to embrace the opportunities around them. And that's what physical literacy does. Open. They make it easy for themselves, like myself here in the video. You, you have to uh, hang yourself to joy, I think, in such things. So with, with that in mind, I'm going to show you through a quick overview of what I'm going to talk through today. 
So building on where Stephen has given a great foundation on what physical literacy is, why it's important and so on. I'm going to talk a little bit about how much activity should kids be doing, why it's important. Talk a little bit about some of our PE research and what that can tell us in relation to coaching. The why the climate of our sessions is so important and what all of this ultimately means for coaching. So many of you may be familiar with this, but some of you may not. Our children need to accumulate 60 minutes a day of physical activity at an intensity that we term moderate to vigorous intensity. And that, that's the amount, the minimum amount of physical activity they need to maintain their own health. So it's not just that they move, but that they move enough to get their hearts and their lungs working harder than normal. And this must include things like muscle strengthening, flexibility and bone strengthening exercises a few times a week. But that intensity, that moderate to vigorous intensity is the intensity level where the kids are slightly out of breath. They're slightly red in the face. They may be sweating slightly, but they've basically got their heart and lungs working hard enough to hit that threshold. And there are a variety of things that make up a child's physical activity. I have a number of them here, here on screen, playing, running, walking, skating, swimming. There's a lot of them here. And of course, one that we're, we're very familiar with is the one of sport. And quite often, people will think of physical activity and sport as synonymous. But in fact, sport is one of the modes of capturing physical activity. And it's one of the most popular ways, for sure, for an awful lot of young people. And if we can hook young people to sport, if we can really get them to engage in a way that they have found their recipe for involvement and, and the thing that they're going to sustain for life, then sport can very well be the vehicle that actually keeps those kids active and, and healthy well into adulthood. So as coaches, why do we need to be concerned about physical activity for health and young people? And again, it can seem like they're two different agendas. You know, we're, we're trying to coach a sport. We're trying to develop these children's aptitudes and abilities in that sport. Why do we need to talk about uh, physical activity as such? Well, th there's some research we've carried out on a particular program at DCU, which is why Pass PE for me. And in fact, I think Wesley O'Brien may also be on the call. I saw him on the participant list earlier. So Wesley's a colleague in UCC who has been involved in this also right from the get go. In fact, he did, did his PhD on this. And the research that we carried out, it showed us, yes, we have low physical activity levels. OK, that's problematic, not just in Ireland, but, but across the world. Also, that consistent with what Stephen spoke about, we have low fundamental movement skill levels. And critically, the children that we're talking about here are adolescents, the 12 to 14 year old age bracket. So the next group up from what Stephen presented on. When myself, Wesley and, and some other colleagues at DCU carried out this particular work, we had one child out of 252 age between 12 and 14, one child out of 252 had mastered the nine fundamental movement skills we measured. Yeah, so that, that's a huge problem. And it's building, as you say, you can see the picture from what Stephen has presented. But what we do know is that it remains consistent. We also know that the gender difference uh, maintains across physical activity and across fundamental movement skills. And what we know is the children who are less active, they have low belief in their own ability to be active. OK, that confidence, that self-confidence, the self-efficacy is low and they have poor motivation to be active and their attitudes towards activity aren't positive. We know females are significantly weaker. We also know across the board, when children are less active, they have poorer knowledge about why being active is important in the first place. So really it brings us around to the point that sport is about more than sport. Physical activity is critical for children, young people and adults, in fact, for a range of reasons. So here on the left, you can see the range of benefits that can accrue from physical activity. And it, I suppose that the headliners usually, and, and they are the headliners for a reason, are that physical activity reduces the risk of coronary heart disease, type 2 diabetes and cancer. But fundamentally, when I'm talking to, to parents about this or teachers, it's this message here that ultimately we can help our children to live happier and healthier for longer. And that as a core goal is, is something critical to, to all, whether it's children, adults, whoever it is, whatever age group we're talking about. And just to put this in context, in terms of where we're at, I'm showing you data on screen here from, from Sport Ireland and from a piece of work we did with Sport Ireland, which they're going to be very au fait with also. And while I'm showing you Irish data here, this is consistent across the world. So across the world, less than 20% of, of adolescents engage in physical activity every day. That's not even meeting the guidelines. 
So just engaging in activity every day. In Ireland, we know that at post-primary level, when we get to the adolescent level, only one child out of 10 is getting sufficient physical activity for their health and well-being. And consistent with the pattern we've spoke about previously, girls are faring worse here than boys. Neither are doing terribly well, but girls are faring worse than boys. And when we look at the role of sport, OK, within school sport, you can see it has a huge role to potentially play here. That 70 percent of children at primary school say, yeah, well, I play sport in school once a week. When they get to fifth and sixth year, which is the upper end of post primary, you can see how high it has dropped. That 38 percent are saying they never participate. 63 percent of children across post primary saying they participate in school sport once a week. And when we look at that outside of the school, which is the community based sport, again, you can see relatively high numbers. So what this tells us is we're not doing well overall. We're not meeting the guidelines, but there is scope. We have quite a bit of access that through sports clubs and coaches, kids are at large turning up. So how can we convert this into something that raises these numbers for health and well-being? And that's not an easy question to answer. Briefly, I want to, to explain to you what YPATH is, I and mean, we won't go too far into it today. But ultimately, it's a school based physical activity intervention. That's where it started. And it was developed based on cross sectional research, which was Wesley's PhD, both qualitative and quantitative data. And the evidence that we gathered there pointed to, clearly to the need to focus on physical literacy in these kids. The components where kids were weak mapped perfectly to that physical literacy construct. And the target cohort in this work was 12 to 15 year olds. And over an eight year period between 2010 and 2018, we iteratively developed, refined and evaluated YPATH to something that we felt was, was working and, and we carried out pretty robust research to evaluate that and, and prove that. And again, coming back to what uh, Stephen presented earlier, why physical literacy? Well, ultimately, these were the aspects that we were seeing we were having problem in, problems with. Our children weren't active enough. They had poor motivation to be active. Their physical competence was not strong at all. And their confidence to be active was, was affected. And this spiral, as, as Stephen spoke about, had that negative effect that those that weren't active were getting less and less active because of this spiral of how these different things interplayed. So in our research that with these adolescents, the physical literacy components, the key components we needed to focus on and we did focus on were one, the children's attitudes, motivation and enjoyment for physical activity, their confidence and beliefs in their abilities, their knowledge and awareness of the need to move, why we actually should move in the first place. And then those physical attributes, both their fitness and body composition, but most directly targeting this aspect, the funda fundamental um, movement abilities. And how we went about that, and I'm going to show a combination kind of model here, which was pulling the socio-ecological model and the theory of self-determination together. And hopefully it doesn't look too complex. It's I'm going to explain it and don't get too lost in, what, in what's showing on screen. But it's it, I suppose it's the underpinning of how we structured white path and how we feel it works. So you have the child at the at the center of this circle here being influenced by the social environment around them, which is their peers, their parents and everything else, the physical environment around that and then policy. And that's always something that we can we can understand that an individual, yes, they may have some element of free choice, but it can be quite limited based on where they're sitting within these different frameworks. And I think COVID and the pandemic and the lockdowns and so on have shown us starkly how much social environment, physical environment and policy can restrict us when we're not allowed out, when we can't engage, when we can't go wherever we like and so on. Um, within that though, however, when we look at the individual, it's also really, really important to look at, well, how motivated are they? What is their level of self-determination? How self-determined are they to be physically active? Are they completely amotivated or are they at a point where they're moving up this ladder here towards being intrinsically motivated to be active, that I am active because I like being active, I enjoy being active, it's something I want to do. Because that's ultimately where we want to get the kids to. If we can get them to this point where they are active because they love it, they engage with it, they, they really enjoy it and they know it's so good for them, then they're more likely to be the active adults and they're more likely to sustain those health benefits into, into adulthood. And within that, the three key aspects, and I'll talk about these again in a second, that we integrated across PE class, across the curriculum, were ensuring opportunities to develop autonomy for those children in the class, develop competence and develop their relatedness, their feeling of belonging to that class and belonging within the class. 
So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But before I do, very briefly, I'm not going to get lost in the research at all. But YPATH is now across the, the country. It's available to all schools across the country through the Irish Heart Foundation, through, through um, a national dissemination programme. And we obviously, to get to that point, had to figure out, did it actually work and does it work? And we have carried out a, a range of, of different trials, from pilot trials to cluster randomised control trials. And the answer is, yeah, it's not easy. It does work. It's not easy. It's not straightforward. But yes, this type of approach does work. And... To, to pin it down, what were the needs and what have we targeted in YPATH? First of all, it's targeting the attitudes, the motivation and belief of these children in their own abilities to be active. And as Stephen spoke about earlier, that's critical. Me believing that I can do is critical. But it's also fundamentally important that I have, the, I have the physical ability to match with that belief, that I don't just believe I'm good, but I actually do have those foundational skills that allow me to be active and allow me to engage. And that's where the fundamental movement skill uh, element comes in. Ensuring in the PE class that there is a strong element of choice has been critical and that there is a cooperative rather than an overly competitive element. And that, that, that can be different from sport to PE class, but that was very, very important for PE class. And then point four was helping to educate these young people on why physical activity is so important in the first place. And this brought us to our focus, having that clear focus for PE, what does it look like? And for us, fundamentally, it was enabling all young people to lead a sustained, physically active life now and into the future and zoning in on that. And like my, my lovely dog, Larry, there's usually a tennis ball in front of him. That's what he does. Once he sees where he needs to be, he doesn't take his eye off it. And that's been a key component of YPAD is ensuring that that focus is consistent and clear and that decisions that teachers make are towards that larger goal. And simply put, what makes it work is the teacher. And it's the teacher creating that right environment, the correct environment, the environment that allows the kids, applying the theory of self-determination, applying those ABCs, allowing the kids opportunity for autonomy, experiencing a sense of freedom and choice within the domain. It, 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 having that feeling of I can do, that confidence that I can do this, and also that they belong, that I relate to this, I feel part of the group and I actually do matter and I can matter. So our target in physical education is in enabling all young people to lead these sustained physically active lives. But that motivational climate within PE class is the linchpin to that. In the PE class, you're trying to enable them to sustain, to sustain activity. And to do this, they need to be more motivated to participate. And not because we're making them, but because they value activity for its own sake. And that's absolutely critical. And it is one of the biggest challenges uh, facing PE teachers is how to create that environment so that all children feel that they actually can and will and do succeed. And the question I would have pulling this back around is, is this also the challenge facing many of us as coaches? Do we understand why our kids are attending the sessions? Are we clued into the motivations and the potential impact that their motivation might have on our retention of them in our session? So in a coaching climate, or sorry, in a coaching session that has fostered a motivational climate, what we're looking at is an environment where, where all the children are learning that they can progress and they can succeed in their own way, that their input is valued and that physical activity can be fun and enjoyable and a way of life for all. And as I said, for the PE teachers, that's not that easy to achieve. And the same goes for coaches, it's not that easy, but there is some really great research out there and there's some really great, great tips and strategies evolving in the research. And as I draw this to a conclusion, I'm going to pull it back to one of the iCoach Kids uh, seminars that was held a, a couple of months ago, I believe, around transformational leadership. So the work of Turnage and Cote, looking at, well, practicing what you preach believing in your athletes, having a person-centered approach, involving athletes in the coaching process. All of this maps perfectly to ex exactly that framework that we use to underpin YPATH. And it maps to that idea of having the motivational climate within your session. And, and Jennifer and John, they broke it down further to look at, well, what is transformational coaching? And when I read this and when I looked at this, I said, well, that's exactly it. It maps so well to what we know is working for us in PE class, modeling pro-social values, showing vulnerability and humility, discussing the goals, the expectations, expressing confidence in athletes' capabilities, implementing a collective vision, that idea of voice, 
providing meaningful and challenging tasks and roles. And that's that needs to be meaningful and challenging to the individual, to the individual child. Eliciting the athlete input, again, having that student or that athlete voice within your coaching sessions, sharing that decision making, emphasizing the learning process, and then showing interest in the athlete's feelings and perspectives, that belonging, you do belong here, I listen to you as much as you listen to me. So there's so much here that overlaps and, and that synergizes, I think, in terms of creating the climate we need to create. And I do think one question we need to come back to as coaches is, no more so than the PE class, but what is the clear focus for our coaching? And that's gonna be different depending on who you're working with. And I, I know and depending on our own coaching philosophies, but we do need, I think, to be able to answer this question if we're going to be able to create the right environment for physical literacy and for physical activity for health. So Shine, for me, um, I'll stop it there. And again, slightly over my apologies, I blame Stephen for setting the scene, but thank you very much uh, for your attention. I'll hand back over, I think is it Declan? Jane, it, it is indeed back to me. Um, between all these buttons on these laptops, you don't always uh, hit the right one at the right time. But thank you both for a, a very interesting and very stimulating presentation. Um, you've left loads of questions for us in the world of sport and coaching and working with children. So we are going to come back to you with a few questions. Um, I'm, I'm going to lead out. Um, some of this might ha ha repeat something that you've already said, but I think it's just an emphasis which might be worth um, benefiting from. Stephen, I might start with you. Um, you mentioned uh, differences between boys and girls in respect to um, object control. How would you suggest that be addressed in the world of sport and coaching? Uh, good question. Um, so the... The obvious answer is to um, to ensure that we're providing enough opportunities for for um, for girls to be taking part in in activities that that have uh, object control etc within it, um, but it's not as easy as that. I remember when we we yeah, got these results first, like the the stereotypical answer was, oh, that's because girls get put into to dance and to ballet and gymnastics and stuff like that, and boys do rugby and football and hurling etc etc, but like we can see that's not the case from the data. So it's a case, it's, it's it for us, it's, we know that it's a problem and um, we now know, we now need to see how we can address it. So we know girls are taking part, but even still when they're taking part, the skills are a little bit lower. So we need to ensure one coach education is up to speed to make sure that we're are developing these skills. But also uh, I think just, just the very fact of knowing it, Declan, allows us to take action you know like we now know in an irish context that 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 cohort they need a little bit of extra work there no more so than the boys do on the locomotor skills so they need to be able to move better and move their body better so for me it's a it's it's as simple as knowledge is power we now know we can do it we've seen in interventions that we've done ourselves and throughout the world that interventions targeting these skills work and they work quite quickly. They don't have to be expensive. They don't have to be uh, uh, a lot of frills with them. Very simple stuff can work. So it's just a matter of, of making sure we put a focus on, on developing those skills, maybe before the sport specific. Uh, maybe the answer isn't what Sarah Jane said, is that we're clear on the purpose of what we're doing within our sports sessions, which is really interesting. Um, you did mention, I'm going to stay with you, Stephen, for one more and then come to, to Sarah Jane. I really liked what you said about coaching being complicated. And I see in the chat, we have some questions about the volunteer coach. Mm -hmm. And of course we need volunteer coaches, certainly in the Irish context, over 90% of the coaches are volunteers um, and their contribution is most welcome. But what I'm getting a sense from you in relation to saying it's complicated and with the evidence you're now presenting um, that we can actually refine what we're doing how do we go from having the volunteer coach who maybe hasn't coached before or been a parent, as you said, um, how can we help them to learn, uh, take on board these ideas and apply them in their, in their practical coaching with boys and girls? Yeah. And I, I think Katrina's question come in there in terms of like using the different phrases and the jargon. And, and mm -hmm. I suppose 
like uh, I would very much like to think that while yes I am a researcher but at the same time I'm a coach and everything we do we try and have it that it's actual a practical output that, that it's not just research for research sake so from my point of view um, the less jargon we can use the better um, and I suppose that's again starts in our coach education as in uh, people come to a coach education course and maybe they think oh I'm going to get a lot of drills or games to work on my football or my hurling or whatever it may be whereas I think um, the focus needs to be on yes this is what you need to do and, and this is how you do it but maybe those softer skills of how to coach are probably need that more of an emphasis in terms of how we can uh, equip um, novice coaches or, or, or volunteers that have no experience to come in and say yeah you will have a group here's a great way to manage a group of 20 or 30 kids here's a great way to um, make sure you're you're touching base with all of them on a weekly basis or whatever whatever your coaching aspect may be um, but 100% I'm talking about fundamental movement skills and physical literacy and I can totally get Katrina's point that volunteer coaches will be will be intimidated potentially by the, by the language so all we're wanting to do is look we want the kids to be able to to have fun be in a safe environment and we want them to be able to move well and if they can move well the sports specific stuff will come come afterwards so for me that's how i would try and approach it and, and try and really ease pit coaches in and uh, to be honest it's nearly sometimes better other you get a coach coming in who's played uh, at a really high level and thinks they know it all and try and train the five-year-olds the same way they train themselves at, a, at a, an elite level, you know? So um, I think there's, there's balance to it too. Might add to that, Declan, if that's all right, um, just around the volunteers aspect, is I think so often with, with the, you know, with the parents that are turning up volunteering week to week, they, they don't have the time or the capacity or, you know, let's say the motivation to, to take coaching courses and so on and so forth. So, a strategy that can work quite, quite well is just having three or four key things and saying to, saying to the, the group of coaches on a Saturday morning, right, okay, these kids have to have fun, right? Let's make sure they leave with a smile on their face. Um, jumping is a problem, right? We know we're struggling with, with jumping. Uh, that, let's have a focus on that over the next few weeks. And just calling out those three or four things so that that's, that's in the brain of every volunteer you have working on, on, on the Saturday morning or the Sunday morning with the 50 or 60 kids you have. And that consistent approach, just week to week, dripping in maybe one more thing, you know, kicking seems to be a problem here, isn't it? What do you think it is? Do you know what it is? I think it's actually where they're planting their foot. Let's keep an eye on that, folks. Now, the that approach works really well. Is it? I'm finding it works really well. The challenge is you have to have the, the head coach with the ability to do that. So where, where I'd be saying we need to direct our, our time and investment is in one good lead coach that can take on that strategy. And that filters out quite well then across the volunteers. That's, that's a real interesting observation, Sarah Jane, because I do think that learning environment, not only for the children in what they're, you're, you're hoping that they learn in your sport and coaching session is important, mm -hmm. but that the, the learning environment for coaches um, is, is there as well. And that sort of reflects the research, which identifies that coaches really learn about their coaching to their practical work. The coaching courses are important. The webinars are important and so on, but it's that opportunity to learn from the actual practice of coaching. And if we don't establish a learning environment in the clubs, um, well then opportunities to learn are lost for both the coaches. Um, and I think the thing we have to look at is being effective in that environment and effective coaches um, and, and therefore we can't avoid the fact that coaching is complicated if it's going to be effective, but we still need everybody to come on, on board. And I think that learning in your club environment is, is, a, is a way that needs probably more explanation and more definition. You've actually answered the question I was going to ask you, Sarah Jane. So thank you for that. And I'm going to pass <laughs> over to Sergio now. <laughs> thanks, Declan. And thanks again to, to Stephen and Sarah Jane for, for two great presentations, really. Uh, lots of thinking really uh, my, my my head is going everywhere uh, but for me one one i just wanted to make an observation and, and and really let you expand on this really if you want uh i found it really interesting and and, and it's something that really goes very well with me and and, and with the i coach kids philosophy really is that actually you, you talked about fundamental movement skills and physical literacy 
but really a lot of the time you talked about, well, before we get to that, we need to sort out the motivational side of things and really get the kids to, to, to enjoy themselves and to, and to be there. Um, is, that, is, that really, is that really where we need to start with all of this before we worry about whether they can throw, catch or, or whatever it is? It, I, I, in my opinion, it just has to go hand in hand that the way in which we approach teaching fundamental movements needs to be in a climate that is motivational because the danger is we end up with kids that can do the skills but don't want to and that's a huge that's that's even more of a problem um so it, the way in which we approach and Declan and Stephen have, have both underlined it and yourself now Sergio it's it's that it's that pedagogy isn't it it's that foundational pedagogical approach overrides everything else we do because if we get that wrong we've lost the kids before we we even start yeah, I, yeah. I'm, go on, sorry, Stephen. So, yeah, no, just like, like fully agree. And, and for me, like the number one job as a coach of kids is that the kids want to come back next week. That's for me, that's my, that's well, are the kids, did the kids enjoy that enough that they're coming back next week? That's my number one priority. And that's coming from me who has such a background in, in this. Um, the second and third priorities are going to be down the list in terms of was it safe environment and then all that sort of stuff. But do they want to come back next week? And then the, developing those fundamental movement skills in a manner that cr sort of fosters that confidence and, and motivates them to try maybe themselves that's that's sort of down a little bit but um if they're, if they're going to come back next week i think we're we're on the right track i couldn't agree more and, and my second observation you know or question really was around you you, you both mentioned the uh, the nine fundamental movement skills that you measured um and, and in, you know the very interesting stat that only one out of 250 plus children were able to master all nine um but i was just wondering if there was a a threshold or or any key fundamental movement skills that need to be in place for someone to have a stronger chance of remaining involved and continue to develop if you had to bank Put, put your put your mortgage on any of those nine or you know what would you prioritize uh it depends on the sport go on Stephen. you go first <laughs> yeah so so that was um originally in in the in the plan for moving well being well sergio we were we we assessed all those fundamental movement skills as well as motivation confidence and, and loads of other different things and the idea was that we'll look at all the data and we'll run a, a an intervention based on the weakest aspects of the data. And then when it comes back and stuff like um, the, the some skills that, that would come back that were very, very weak, um, for example, like a gallop and stuff like that, right? But then when we started trying to look at that in terms of an, an Irish context, we were like, well, where does this fit in in terms of the activities that they can go on to go to, to do after the fact, right? So we, 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 we saw... Well, look, if we can help kids run, if we can help kids jump, that transfers into nearly every sport. If we can help kids to, um, to have the, the wherewithal to be able to, to throw, catch, kick um, and, and things like that, that will transfer into a huge amount of field sports or individual sports that, that involve uh, ob object manipulation. So we, we had the research, it, the, the data telling us this is the weakest points, and then we had reality over here, and we tried to sort of merge that somewhere in the middle. And that's where the, the, we were sp speaking before we came on, that it depends and it's so important, and that context is key, um, because we could have taken data from Australia or Canada or whatever and just ran an intervention, but we would have lost out on that Irish context, which for me is crucial when, we're, when you're trying to plan something like that. Yeah. So I don't have an answer for you, I suppose, <laughs> a straight answer, but we're working on it. But I think within what, what you said there, Stephen, and I would agree with it, like if you were to look to take a broad range of sports, I think if we can focus on running, jumping, throwing, catching and kicking, if we can generate those, you open up a menu of options for kids to go on and, and specialise and progress and so on. So. I know we've Wesley O'Brien on the call, actually, who is probably more expertise than myself and Stephen in this area. Well, then me anyway, Stephen, I won't speak for you. So he might have another answer on that. But that would be my kind of initial thought on it. Yeah. And, and balance balance as well will be uh, yeah. one that I would definitely add in. Yeah. And I'm just going to uh, sort of make one observation and then hand over to Gary for some questions from, from the audience. But really, I, I love what you said, uh, Sarah Jane, around the fact that, that actually the, the actual sport you coach is secondary. That, that you're really trying to develop the, the kids' movement skills. 
Um, and I always, because because when I'm when I'm teaching the students or when I'm working with coaches, there's always that um, that worry or that concern that yes, I want to develop the fundamental movement skills, but I'm, I'm in a football context. The parents expect me to do some football. The kids expect to play some football. And I, my answer is always, well, you can still work on the fundamental movement skills with a theme of football and, 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 and kind of uh, these guys in them through the football, right? Um, so it's not that you, you don't have to give up your sport to concentrate on the other stuff. Uh, it's, it's, it's how do you get your priorities right, really? But you can always keep the flavor if you want uh, to, to make sure that. Would you agree with that or, do, or would you suggest that you kind of have to be very explicit at, uh, in, in, your, in your approach? Uh, t totally agree. Uh, like, if you go down to, uh, we ha we call it our nursery. So we basically four to seven year olds on a Saturday morning went before pre COVID anyway, um, and they all think they're playing fo Gaelic football and hurling when in reality they're absolutely not. They are playing a, a game that has been developed or devised to focus on fundamental movement skills or a social interaction or a uh, some sort of uh, there's a there's a higher task at play rather than hurling or football now they do develop uh, into the the hurling and football skills as they go through those years but the first thing is we're trying to create a love for the game and a love to get them to come down next week and then we're trying to disguise the the, the fms as best we possibly can uh, certainly from that extent yeah, I agree completely. And so much of it, it needs to be driven by the kids. You know, you, you need to base so much of what you're doing on where they want to be and where they should go next. And as you say, Steve, you have that, you know where the path is taken. You have your ultimate goal, your year's goal or your two-year goal or your, your monthly goal. But the kids have no sight of that. And it's getting to that place in a way that you've brought them all with you. And that's where the children's voice is just critical in that. Where do they want to be? Uh, and how do you create the environment so that it is where they want to be, but you're also achieving what needs to be achieved? Brilliant. Thank you for that. So I'm, I'm going to hand over to Gary uh, and see if there's anything from the audience that we haven't answered yet. Yeah, you, you've both done an exceptional job at addressing quite a few of the questions that we've had, which is great. Um, but we still have a few um, that our audience have outstanding. And I'll share one with you here from Thomas. So Thomas has asked, at what stage or age do kids outgrow fundamental movement skills and need to move on to the next stage more transitional skills or, or play skills um he shared an experience that he's been working on fundamental movement skills for the last two years and really looking to to move the children on i wonder what your thoughts are yeah it it, it depends as stephen said so it, it that it that is one that you can say yeah by age x children should be ready to progress but it really depends on the particular group of kids you have in front of you and Quite often what I find is you'll have half of them that are ready really to progress with the sport specific skills and half that aren't ready at all yet. And you need in the session to kind of cater for both. You can't hold back, but you need to create an environment where that progression isn't isn't blankly one to the next that it's actually there is a transition and there is a progression and you do a little bit of both and set up tasks and challenges that allow the kids to select a progressive uh, advancement of the skill or to do a basic version of the skill but within the same session so that no one is looking at you know x doing y over there that we're all doing the same thing but doing it in the way that we're ready and able to do Stephen, you might have more to yeah well like yeah the same like like research is it's sometimes it's lovely and neat oh yeah you should have all them skills mastered by the age of eight but what happens if the kid only started when they were six what happened compared to the kid who started when they were four so there's all these different variables involved. What I would be saying is um, the fundamental movement skills, uh, we taught like the, the wider the base and the more skills they have, the more tools you're giving them to be active later in life, okay, for in any different activity. So in a long-term lens, doing more is not going to do any harm. Um, but what I would also say is how are you measuring them? So how do you know you're getting better at those skills? And I'm not saying you have to have research grade uh, measurement tools or anything like that, but but how do you know they're getting better? How are you tracking your progress? How do you know 90% of the kids are have mastered these amount of skills and et cetera? And as, as Sarah Jane said there then, how then are you catering for the various different people in your group, whether it be, uh, they be weak in the middle or advanced because you don't want to help progress everyone on. So I know Thomas, that's probably not a, a clear cut answer for you, but I would be saying, 
uh, monitoring how you're going through and in and, and terms of how the progression is going and then how then can you add on to that there's absolutely fine to add the sport specific skills then in and the more sport specific movement in and um, but i'd say just make sure that you're bringing everyone along gary i might come in there too um we we've been using a model in ireland uh which we i, I suppose uh, worked in conjunction with Sergio on called the multi-skill jigsaw. So as well as fundamental movement skills, uh, we considered the fundamentals of movement, which were things like balance and overall coordination. But that fundamental uh, multi-skill jigsaw also included fundamental game skills. So it's not just fundamental movement skills out of context you're putting into the context of activity. There are described in the multi-skill jigsaw as underpinning sport-specific skills. So it would be a natural progression to move between fundamentals and sport-specific. And if you're seeing things in your sport-specific context, move back to the fundamentals um, to work on those. So the other thing is, I think, if you look at your sport-specific context, you'd identify those fundamentals that underpin that. Uh, and therefore, that would also help you in, in moving back and forth. But then it does depend, as Stephen said, on where the children are at and where the, where where uh, you're, you're aiming to move to. Thanks for that. No, thank you, Declan. Um, just moving on to our next question, which is um, which is somewhat linked, and it comes from it comes from Barney. Obviously, terms like fundamental movement skills um, are terms that can often be buzzwords and, and words that coaches just use to to make it sound like they're doing a good job why why do we think that physical literacy has often become misunderstood or misused I, I in some ways I think physical literacy is a term that was adopted because it would give some credence I guess to something that we all knew was important you know and, and how do we use language in a way that it'll get policymakers, uh, school principals and so on to sit up and say okay well it's using the word literacy so this must be important so that unfortunately has the downside then of when you actually want to make on the ground changes and difference the language can become a barrier and, and I think that's probably how and why that has happened and to me fundamentally yes physical literacy is important using the term physical literacy doesn't matter at all if we know what it is we want to achieve which is motivation confidence uh, it's your self-efficacy it's your your physical abilities it's the knowledge and understanding it's it's all of these things combined and they're things we've known for years you know we can label them this way that way or the other but fundamentally they're the things we want to know and develop and that's the language we should be using on the ground with coaches or a breakdown of that language bit by bit to build up what we actually want to achieve. Thanks, Sarah Jane. Stephen, anything to add on that one? Uh, no, uh, I see uh, Gillian made a comment in there and it, it sort of resonated that the, the, it's part of the scary phil philosophical component of the construct. And, and there again, absolutely dead right. But again, I think it's just that people it's gone back to the earlier points get maybe a little bit confused or get a little bit um um the, the jargon is a little bit much and it just it just muddies the water and um, whereas physical literacy should be a really really good easy message to understand if if everyone if we're all doing our jobs right uh in terms of that sort of connected piece so um some more work to do i think hmm um, I think we've got time for one last question, uh, and this has come from Teresa, um, who has said that when we say active parents help too, which I think, um, Stephen or Sarah, you mentioned within your presentations, how can we help parents understand the importance of, of these movement skills and, and support and to help them support their children through practice and play? You know, that's a really interesting one in that a year ago or yeah, a year ago, I would have said it's it's really challenging. It's really hard to do through school. It's it's impossible to do through coaching clubs. But actually, COVID nineteen and coaching through Zoom and trying to reach the parents in all these ways has provided an opportunity where I would say a lot of the parents of my kids at the moment have a far better grasp of what fundamental movement skills and how to help their kids develop these now than they would have had a year ago, purely by virtue of the way we've engaged with them. So I think there's a learning in that. 
that and we've done it through WhatsApp groups, you know, and then quick Zoom calls, but setting out little tasks, you know, to see if you can get your here's this week's challenge, you know, see how many your child can get in a minute doing this, you know, practice it every day, those type of challenges that has opened up parents eyes. And of course, I'm drip feeding in things about physical activity and health and so on through that. And I'd never have thought to do that before. But now it's something that we'll definitely maintain with those groups. So I think there's some learnings that we can take from the pandemic that might actually help an answer to that question. Yeah, hundred um, yeah, percent. Yeah, it's difficult, and uh, like again, the coach education piece is, is so crucial here in terms of what the where the focus is and, and where the focus is put on. Um, but I think t- t- just to back up what Sarah Jane said, it's so easy to access parents now through all the various different um, or, or webinar or whatever that may be. It's so easy to access it now that there are several other options we can now start exploring. So it's not just a traditional method of having the parents in the hall, teaching them, et cetera, et cetera. We can now back that up with maybe a webinar or a YouTube resource or whatever it may be. And I should look at the iCoach Kids in terms of the, the, the popularity of the videos on YouTube. So I think we just have to continue exploring those uh, avenues and COVID has probably accelerated that quite a bit. Um, so it's a case of seeing where we can exploit that to, to get the message to parents a little bit better. Thank you. And, and I guess I guess you're absolutely right that there, there have been lots of opportunities to experiment with with Zoom and, and digital learning that we, we perhaps haven't been afforded in the past. That means that we're we're one year smarter now at that than we would have been otherwise. Um, thank you very much for your response to the audience questions and thank you to the audience too for to type in those in the boxes. I'm now just going to hand back over to Sergio. Thanks, Gary. Uh, and thanks again to Stephen and Sarah Jane for, for really getting us all thinking about this. Before I wrap it up, I'm going to hand over to Declan. Uh, I know Declan has some, some points to make. Thanks very much, uh, Sergio. I really wanted to just thank Stephen and Sarah Jane for their thought-provoking presentations and discussion afterwards. And thanks also to the audience uh, who we encourage to promote good practice in coaching and in children's sport. Um, I, I think while we're, we've spoken about children and their learning, just the end of the conversation was around the coach and their learners too. And how we have coaches learn this new knowledge and the skills is also going to be part of what we roll out. Um, in, our, in Sport Ireland, we're enthusiastic supporters of iCoach Kids. Um, you know, we, we, we look to rally those in Ireland interested in quality movement experiences for, as we say, each and every child and want to work in the Irish context and want to work with I coach kids to contribute to the change in the paradigm that is needed for children's sport. So thank you very much. Back to you, Sergio. Thanks, Declan. And, and I was really going uh, come to come to that as well, that using your best uh, object manipulation skills, uh, Declan, Sport Island has really grabbed the bull by the horns and is really taken, taken uh, to, to this topic uh, from a number of angles, really. So I really wanted to commend you and, and, and all your colleagues, Sheila, uh, Michael, uh, all the people that you have engaged in, in, in Ireland. Uh, we know Aikotskis has a huge following in Ireland. It's, it's a second home for us, really, in that sense. Um, so, no, congratulations to everybody there for the work that you're doing. Congratulations to Stephen and Sarah Jane for really asking the right questions and, and, and starting to find some of the answers as, as we go along. Uh, we welcome you to the iCoach Kids family again, and we hope that this is not the last time we have a chance to, to speak with you and to feature you in any of our, any of our outlets, really. Um, on that note, um, everybody else, uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, please stay safe, stay connected, um, get out and do some physical activity if you can. Um, if you're not allowed, just do something at home. Uh, but like I say, please stay safe and stay connected. And we will see you soon. Uh, Gary, when is our next webinar before we wrap up? Uh, we don't have a date set yet, but we are due to have one at the end of April. So please stay tuned to our social media channels. Uh, we are at iCoachKidsWorld or forward slash iCoachKidsWorld on Twitter, on YouTube and on Facebook. So please follow us. Um, like and subscribe to find out more about our upcoming events thanks everyone